Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Jill, so much for inviting me to talk here today on a topic that I'm extremely passionate about, and that's the topic of clinical trials. And uh, looking around in the audience, I recognize so many people that have come to work with me and our unit um, on clinical trials. And the reason why I'm so passionate about trials is that it's an amazing opportunity for us to collaborate with pharma and with the patients in the developments of new therapies. So for those of you that are not happy with the therapies you're currently on, either they're not efficacious or the mode of administration is not to your liking, and I know there are aspects of many of the currently available drugs that do fit one of those categories. There is hope on the horizon. There's an in, there are an enormous number of clinical trials currently underway and pending that address these critical issues in the acromegaly space where patients really are reliant probably for extremely long periods of time on therapies that might not work that well or might not be as pleasant to administer as people would like. I will say that over the last 20 years, the advances have been absolutely remarkable. When I first started working in the space, there was really very little around. It was even the pre triotide days. And now there are just several excellent choices. The efficacy is on the up and up. And there's really a huge accent on improving the methods of administration that will make these drugs easier to take. So I'm going to start off with just um, an introduction to what clinical trials are and a little bit of general background into how they come about, the funding, the, the responsibilities, and then I'm going to summarize the currently available trials um, that, that, that are, are on the horizon and currently happening, and uh, then I'm hoping there'll be plenty of time for questions afterwards. So... Um, so um, a clinical trial is actually a research study um, which tests how well new medical approaches work. It can be related to a number of different topics, disease prevention, disease diagnosis, disease treatment. And as you can see, these are all critical topics which all need to be carefully dissected and investigated in order for us to be able to develop tools that will attain better control and increase the quality of life of our patients. So there are several subsections of the way that diseases present, affect people, and then result in complications, all of which needs to be addressed in carefully planned trials. The basic important um, underlying goal of all trials is firstly to establish an efficacy, because if that if treatments don't work, then what's the point of having them? But neck to neck with neck with efficacy is the safety issue. And it's obviously absolutely critical that um, these drugs are safe. And in fact, as we start clinical trials, and you'll see that, the earlier phases are really involved more in safety than efficacy, especially as, this, as before the drugs even get larger. So before they're even released for trial, um, the earliest part of the trials are involved in the safety issues so that people who are participating in trials to see whether they're efficacious know that they're getting onto these agents with a, with a safe drug uh, in hand. So I just want to stress that as a start for people that are fearful because they don't feel that there's a safety affirmation. That is generally a very important part of the earliest part of drug investigation to establish that it's safe. Um, it would be just totally unacceptable to be investigating something that wasn't safe. So that's already been established up front. And obviously there are little nuances that need to be tweaked as we work with drugs, but the basic safety issues have been established prior or in the earliest phases of the trial, many of which might not be even on sick people, maybe in healthy people, animals, um, but a safety issue 
is way high up on the list before we even confirm the efficacy, and that makes sense in terms of um, protecting our patients. Um, so there are several different ways that clinical trials can be run. Um, and for people that have participated, I'm sure you're aware, they're control groups, they're non-controlled non trials, they're randomized trials, and they try all different forms of trial structure. And that's what this list, the, the details of which are not important, but there's sometimes people ask, how come there isn't a control group? How come I have to be part of the control group? But these are all techniques in study design that are developed in order to be sure that we get robust data at the end, not only in terms of efficacy and safety. And there are a number of different recognized uh, pathways, or we call them protocols, to proceed with clinical trials. And this is just a list of some of the major ones which help investigators structure how they're going to plan um, the pathway of investigation. And obviously, the clearer and the more smart that is, the better the result at the end of the day. So really planning these design, the, the design of these studies and deciding how the pathway is that people are going to follow to establish the endpoints of the trial is critical. And once patients spend hours, um, pharma spends billions of dollars establishing these studies and trials, and unless they're carefully designed, with good endpoints in sight and well-honed mechanisms of reaching the answers that we're seeking, everybody has wasted their time and money. So it's absolutely critical that these trials where people spend a ton of time, goodwill participating, um, a, a fortune of money is spent, and at the end of the day, we really do want a good answer. So the, really the study design is critical to be sure that we get objective, well-validated data that gives us all the confidence to prescribe these drugs and you the confidence to take them. Um, sorry. Um, so, so yet again, it's really about the safety and the efficacy um, in terms of how we plan these studies. There's no typical length. Um, they may take, a, an ex in a really long period of time, 10 to 15 years to complete all the phases. You know, I think we need to go back. No. Um, there's, there's no typical length of how, how long the trials are. They may take 10 to 15 years to complete all, all the phases of the trials. And the FDA does require extensive clinical trial testing in order for drugs to be licensed. So they actually demand the amount of testing that needs to, to happen to ensure not only efficacy, but particularly safety. So the cost of clinical trials is, is, a, huge, is a huge issue, um, and the research costs are related to a number of issues. Um, firstly, there are um, costs that are related to supplying the new treatment. Then there are costs related to all the testing, um, and many of it is highly specialized testing. Then there's um, patients have to do extra physician visits, including travel, and that's frequently covered in trials. And then there are the actual costs of the research. The, uh, the, the time of the staff that, 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 that executes the study, the tests that, that are performed, and then the drugs that are actually uh, that are, are being tested, and possibly other drugs that they might be compared to. So the costs are actually millions of dollars. And who are the sponsors of these trials? So many of them are sponsored by the NIH. Um, uh, uh, an, an enormous number, too, are sponsored by the drug manufacturers, particularly of drugs that they're trying to get to market. And then tech companies also sponsor a fair number of studies. Um, 
in terms of the phases of clinical trials, and this is a term that's often bandied about um, quite loosely, so I thought I'd just describe it because patients often read things about phases of trials. And just to give you some orientation and perspective as to what this, re this refers to. So um, as I'd mentioned earlier, clinical trials are rolled out in different stages, which are called phases. And there are actually three main phases, phase one, two, and three. And as I said earlier, the earliest trial phase looks at side effects of the drug, looking mainly at drug safety. And then later trial phases look at how well the treatment works. So just emphasizing again that safety uh, takes the front seat all along as we're investigating the efficacy. Um, so as I said, there are, these three, there are three phases. Um, phase one, uh, which is the first phase, is usually a small phase, only 20 to 50 people. It tracks side effects. Um, and the last column is about randomization. Generally, it's a, not a randomized study. So they just 20 or to 50 people are invited and everybody just proceeds on the same re research a track, and it's really to track side effects. The second phase um, is, this, is, is a medium-sized phase. It usually involves tens of people, rather just a handful of people. It, it largely tracks side effects further, um, and um, it's a sometimes a randomized trial. It also looks at this phase a little bit as to how well the, how well the drug actually works. The third phase is the large phase studies, and not in the acromegaly space because we have a, a very rare disease, but in, in other more common diseases, this is usually hundreds to thousands of um, patients. And the point of uh, phase three trials is to compare new treatments to old, so that by the end of drug investigation, we've firstly established safety, we've secondly confirmed efficacy, and thirdly, we can present some sort of comparison as to how the new medications um, uh, stack up against old ones in terms of efficacy, safety, um, and people's um, comfort level with taking on something new. And the, the third phase trials are usually randomized. So randomization is a process whereby, and this is an important thing to understand because it sometimes frustrates people that want to, to participate in a trial, but randomization does lend an enormous strength to the study because what that means is that people are randomly assigned to different study arms. And the idea of that is to have people doing slightly different tracks of medication and if one randomizes people, then you don't get all the different responders in one arm. So it mixes up the people that come into a study. And in the three different arms, anybody could be assigned. By anybody, I mean people who may be poor responders, people who may be medium responders, people who may be good responders. We don't want to have run a study where, in, say, for example, the low-dose track all the good responders got on there, and in the high-dose track, all the poor responders got, because that wouldn't really give us any idea of how to dose these drugs or the safety. So the ideal trial is a randomized trial whereby people are really, by being pulled out of a hat, it's just a total randomized assignment of people to the different pathways in the study all of which examine different aspects of the study. So we want to get a real mixed up batch of people randomly coming to those different arms of the study so that we have the most objective data um, as to all the different aspects that we're looking at. So we always, although they're the toughest trials to design, they give us the best data, randomized trials, to be able to really validate that all comers have the same chance of responding and all people have the same chance of getting side effects or not. And that's really critical when we're trying to affirm that these are safe and effective medicines and also to compare them to other medicines, the more random it is, 
the better and more objective the data is in terms of everybody having the right opportunity to respond or develop the side effect. So it's really a large phase three randomized trial, which gives us at the end of the day, the confirmation and comfort that these are safe and effective drugs. So what happens to people who participate in clinical trials? Participants receive specific interventions according to the research plan or protocol. And the intervention could be a new drug or a new device. It could be a procedure. So we could be testing how people do with certain procedures that either will or won't help their disease, or it could be a change in patients' behavior. For example, if one followed a diet, how would that impact the disease? So it's a very broad way of testing all different aspects of disease course and disease interface with different interventions. So some things the patients can do themselves and we want to scientific, scientifically evaluate how their participation in whatever aspect that is, for example, a diet is able to affect their disease. Or it could be if they undergo a certain procedure, a minor surgery, insertion of a stent, for example, in, in other specialties, how would that impact their disease course, or it could be in our specialty, mainly new drugs. How do these um, affect and impact um, people's lives and their responses? So in terms of um, the acromegaly space, um, this is a cartoon that I think uh, um, a lot of people in this room are familiar with. Um, and basically, um, the um, growth hormone is is um, secreted by the pituitary gland at the top of the blue arrow. Um, it travels to the liver, where on the surface of the liver, there are receptors that bind the growth hormone. And then there is um, a bunch of intracellular, intracellular signaling in the liver, which um, involves elaboration of excess IGF-1 from the liver. And it really is the IGF-1 insulin-like growth factor that in adults especially is responsible for many of the effects of acromegaly that, um, that are so bothersome to our patients. And we have a variety of different drugs that can work in different levels of these pathways. And as you can see, the list is expanding continuously. So the drugs that are currently FDA approved and in use are in, are in black and the new drugs which are currently under investigation are in red. And you can see that there are established drugs that work on the pituitary and inhibit pituitary growth hormone secretion, like the sandostatin analog, sandostatin LAR, somatuline, lanreotide, cabergoline, which is a drug which is used um, as a second line drug, often in combination with a somatostatin analog, Zorpec Visamont, also works on the pituitary to suppress growth hormone secretion. Mycapsa is a newly FDA-approved oral somatostatin analog. And then there are two agents, which we're going to discuss in a little detail, which are, are currently under clinical trial, peltucetine and CAM, CAM2029. So that's the cohort of drugs currently um, approved or in clinical trials, um, hoping to be FDA-approved soon, that work on the pituitary and inhibit growth hormone secretion. And then the second group of drugs work on the liver. So they block um, the access of growth hormone to the liver um, or the translation of the, um, the, the translation of the growth hormone binding into IGF-1 in the liver. And I'll show you the mechanism of those. So they work either binding to the surface of the liver, inhibiting the growth hormone binding, or blocking the growth hormone action in the liver that then elaborates IGF-1. And by these mechanisms, uh, these two different sites you can see inhibit and decrease growth circulating growth hormone, which then decreases circulating IGF-1, and that lowers levels, hopefully, to normal. So looking at uh, the most recently FDA-approved um, oral agent for acromegaly, Mycapsa. This is a really nice cartoon, and I'm going
going to just go through it um, in some detail, walk you through it. Um, so it was very smartly designed in order to be able to be orally absorbed. So the former somatostatin analogues, octreotide, LAR, lanreotide, pathreotide, as everyone in this room is aware who's on these agents, have been injectables. Um, fortunately, through research um, over the years, the frequency of in injection has really improved dramatically from three to four times a day to once a month, which is really uh, a remarkable improvement. However, there's still uh, room for improvement here. And fortunately, there are, there are now the development of many oral agents that are either just been approved or coming to market, which can just be swallowed daily, which is far more amenable to some patients. Although I have many patients that still just want a once a month shot and be done with it. But there are lots of people, especially newly diagnosed people that are daunted about having to take shots um, and they don't even want to do it once a month. So for those people, there now is you know, an FDA approved oral agent, which is efficacious and safe and well absorbed. And this cartoon um, shows the mechanism of how it's absorbed. So um, there is a substance called TPE, transient permeability enhancer. And the, the function of that agent is to open the tight junctions that we have in the gut. So the gut is a tube that's very tightly sealed and it really has to be tightly sealed. Otherwise, substances that were swallowed would just leak out into the surrounding gut and wouldn't have a chance to be absorbed in order to be effective. So one of the major challenges of having an oral agent has been um, the ability to traverse those tight junctions and break them and enable the drugs to be absorbed. And this brilliant um, development um, has enabled that to happen. So the substance called TPE, those little yellow, uh, the yellow fluid that the drug is suspended in, has the ability to break the tight junctions between the cells of the gut and open little pathways and then close them very rapidly so that after the drug gets in, which is swallowed in a capsule with a transient permeability enhancer, after the transient permeability enhancer opens the, the little gaps, the, opens gaps, the drug is able to very quickly move out into the bloodstream and be absorbed into the body, and then the gaps close again. So I've spent a lot of time um, uh, um, explaining how this very smart invention has worked because this has been something that's been on our minds for decades. How can we get this to be swallowed orally? And this is the first preparation. And um, it does need to be taken a distance from meals because you can imagine that once those gaps are open, the food would all leak out. So the, the major disadvantage now is that these drugs, this drug has to be timed with eating, which is a bit of a hassle, but for people that don't want to be bothered or are, are daunted with injections or don't want to have to have injections, this is really a remarkable breakthrough um, and something that I know many people have constantly asked for and waited for. So it's a very smart um, invention and I think it's going to be worked on to, to be improved all the time, but we've, we have a major breakthrough here in terms of developing an oral agent which is in everybody's mind. So um, another agent which is currently under investigation um, by Crinetics is a drug called Peltucetine, and this works in a completely different mechanism. And I really am not going to bore everybody with a mechanism, but just to show you that, um, they, that all these drugs have been developed with hours and hours of research for different mechanisms of absorption. Um, Peltucetine is also an oral agent. It's a once daily agent, so that's already a, a step up from a micapsa, which is twice a day. And it is in, currently in phase three study. So um, this is a, a very big, large study now, hopefully to gather enough data for FDA approval. Um, another agent which is um, under investigation 
is CAM 2029 um, and by a company called Camurus, and it's also a depot of triotide. So this cartoon shows um, in the top, um, in the top um, panel the injection of the agent into the subcutaneous um, tissue. And you can see there the skin with the hair follicles and the needle deposits um, a fluid crystal gel just below the surface of the skin. And the gel is expanded by absorbing water from the surrounding um, tissue space. And with the absorption of the water and the expansion of the gel, you can see the release of the drug which is embedded in the center of the gel. And there's just a slow release with a, and you can see in the final um, picture, the final panel, there's a really nice um, uh, constant solid release so that the drug levels stay extremely constant as the um, agent is released into the, um, into the, into the subcutaneous tissue. Um, and that's obviously very important. So you've got this, let's call it a pellet, sitting under the skin doing its thing, but the most important thing is that the drug distribution is continuous and constant because in order to have sustained suppression of hormone levels, we need to have sustained drug levels. And we really are reliant on you know, a bubble of drug that gets really a remarkable thought, a, a bubble of drug that's been deposited into the, under the surface of the skin and then just slowly releases um, the, the good stuff to really um, uh, suppress the levels. So it's really remarkable the tricks and tools that have been thought about to enable these drugs not to have to be injected on a two, three, or four time basis, which is painful and very inconvenient, but yet we need to attain our goal, which is constant delivery of a very adequate dose of drug, or we will not have suppression of the hormones that we're trying to treat. So it's, it's really taken years of development um, of smart techniques to really be able to let these drugs do their magic without our supervision or administration on a daily or many times a day basis. And it's just really smart. Um, as I've watched and worked with the development of these drugs, I'm just in awe of how ideas have come about um, to, to, to make this drug available, which ha as, other, as all drugs, which needs a constant sustained delivery in a non-painful way. So that's been the challenge. And it's really heartwarming after all these years of working in partnership with pharma to see amazing mechanisms like this having now being um, achieved that enable us to deliver these um, helpful medications on a sustained, safe, um, painless way. Um, so the final drug I'm gonna discuss is Simdelicin, which is um, being um, developed by a company called Ionis. And this drug prevents growth hormone signaling in the liver. So once the growth hormone is bound, this drug uh, reduces the IGF levels. It doesn't affect the growth hormone levels. It just reduces the IGF levels. And it's, uh, as I mentioned, IGF is really the major um, messenger of growth hormone activity. And with reduced IGF levels, growth hormone levels, um, the IGF levels fall. And also the feedback loop, which stimulates more growth hormone is suppressed. So in that way, growth hormone levels are lowered. So this is currently being proposed as an add-on treatment for patients with uncontrolled acromegaly on medical treatment, but we'll see how that plays out once um, this is released. So just uh, to, for those that are interested to show you that this is actually a drug which blocks the mRNA. So um, it's, in, it's very early in the stage of, um, of, of translation. So DNA, um, gets converted to RNA, and then that um, gets translated into a disease-associated protein. And by blocking the RNA, which this drug does, there's lack of translation of this disease-associated protein, and um, the levels fall. So um, it's a very smart drug, too, that works 
um, very, very much earlier in the whole cycle than several of the drugs that we've discussed earlier. So um, I've shown you a whole gamut of amazing new technologies that um, have thankfully been developed and are now being really tweaked to, make, to, to be sure that they're firstly safe, secondly efficacious, and that these very smart methods of uh, administration are really as robust as we're hoping. And if that happens, I think we're going to end up with a whole new generation of acromegaly medicines that are easy to deliver, need to be administered far less frequently, and are hopefully more effective, but hopefully as effective as the agents that we, we currently have. So I'm going to stop there and take some questions. I, hi. Hi. I, I would love for you to bore me with the Crenetics version of the uh, the gut transfer method. You 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 said you didn't want to bore us with that difference, but the uh, my capsa didn't work for me. But I have some unique uh, issues with my gut that other people may not have. So I'm very curious in the transport methodology if you can speak to that. Um, with the paltucetine. Sure. Um. Uh, yes. So you, you would like to hear exactly how the mechanism works? Yeah, it's different from the TPE. Yes, so, it, so um, I don't think we have, we were, um, I don't think how exactly it's absorbed has been released. Um, I, uh, that, that's nothing that I've seen in the literature. Um, uh, it's, it's an oral administered medication, and um, I, I don't think it has as complex a, a mechanism, and it doesn't need to because it's a completely different formulation to, to, to my capsa. So it, uh, that's, that's nothing that they've emphasized in terms of Oh, I see what you're getting at. So the the the, the mechanism for um, for my capsa is uh, was developed in order to get octreotide into the system um, through the gut. So this this um, this preparation is not an octreotide preparation at all. It's a completely different. So digestion of in the gut is not is is not an issue with this preparation. So. Um, the oral, the, 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 the reason for developing the Marcapsa was to develop an oral form of an injectable medication. And this is, this is a completely different formulation that yeah. doesn't have that. So I, I think that's I not see. even something that this will concern injection. you. This is, this is not an injectable. It's an oral. It's a, an oral preparation from the get-go. It's not a tree. But it needs to go through the gut wall instead of getting digested. Well, it, it's just absorbed like any other drug would be. Okay. Um, yeah. Whereas my capsa needs it. Ah, a creatide would get digested or. A creatide would, would, be a, would be digested. So they had to find a way of protecting it and, and then opening the, the, the gut. Things. So you. it's not really a comparable thing because the challenges of the drugs are different. This is not an octreotide preparation at all. Oh, that's super good to know. Right. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, Dr. Hi. Ronner. <laughs> Hi. So I just wanted to make more of a statement than anything um, to those of you that might be thinking about doing a clinical trial or a study, I did a study with, and I got to meet this wonderful lady in California. I got to go to California several times, um, and it was totally paid for, um, and I highly recommend that you consider doing a clinical trial or a study. Um, it's worth it. 
I got to talk to her about my specific um, case as well as try out a different medicine. Um, and um, it, was, it was just very worth it. So I highly recommend that you consider it and talk to, there's plenty of us in here that have done clinical trials or studies and uh, would be happy to talk to you. So thank you for thank all you, you do. And I'm gonna just jump in on the back of, yeah. of that and ask what, what it is about clinical trials that do make people apprehensive. Perhaps we could spend a little time discussing that um, and um, it, it might give people some ease of mind about participating. Placebo. Placebo. Yeah. Okay. So, and that, and that is, and that is a very fair, um, that is a very fair um, concern. And uh, certainly, we, when we sign up to do clinical trials that we don't engineer ourselves, we look very carefully, and we're often fortunately invited to, to participate in the study design. And we're very careful in a lot of the things that we get involved, in all of the things we get involved in, that if people get um, uh, assigned to the placebo arm, which you understand, and painful as it is, it does really contribute very effectively to our data, because if you can compare it to nothing, that's obviously the safest, that you've got the, the most valid data, because you've got numbers that are generated on the drug and then numbers that are generated not on the drug. So the data is way more e efficacious be because you've got a really valid comparison. Um, but, you know, we don't like people to be on placebo and people also don't like to, to be on it themselves. But some of the things that we do when there is placebo is we the, the placebo arm and all the, the whole study is extremely well and carefully monitored and it's designed that the placebo is the short is short but effective and then to make up for it I always try and have a rollover phase after that where people everyone then gets drug for a very extended period of time to kind of make up for what they went through in the placebo part. So when there's placebo, there's generally a crossover. Where people don't just do placebo, leave the trial and be done with it. In smartly designed trials, there's placebo and then people get drug and that provides very concrete data as to nothing and something when people are their own control. So it is a painful, path um, and we try and make up for it by firstly keeping that phase very short and then secondly rolling people over into an extremely lengthy phase often till FDA approval um, if, if it's late enough in this in the study um, to be able to, um, to, to, to for people to really uh, have the benefit of long-term treatment with that medication. So generally it's it's swapped to a treatment arm as well. They're not just placebo and then nothing. And then hopefully they get a long-term treatment until the drug is approved. And also placebo arms are earlier in drug development rather than later. Right. So, so mentioned in uh, often to to accommodate it, there is rescue therapy. So, um, if people start developing symptoms, um, there there is the opportunity to be treated there and then and stop the trial, or to be rescued and continue. So that's how rescue therapy works. Or if you want to continue, you 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 could continue on the drug of the of the trial. Question. Hi. Sure. Um, thank you very much. What I see these are pharmaceuticals designed to suppress the growth hormone and its effects on the tissues. What about 
medications in the pipeline to suppress the tumor itself and cause it to regress. Right. So um, you, the, the most effective um, way of suppressing the tumor is an initial debulking surgery. So most pe the treatment algorithm really involves initially a debulking surgery so that people are left after that um, with the smallest volume of tumor that's safely possible if the tumor is not able to be completely eradicated. Then there's radiotherapy often in many um, algorithms to, um, to ablate what remnant tumor is left, and then medical therapies um, are usually called upon to control uh, drugs, uh, hormone secretion from the tumor remnant. So the ma these drugs generally don't uh, affect the tumor volume. They, they do need to maintain it. So one thing we want to be sure of is that the tumors don't grow, but we know that these drugs are not that effective in terms of decreasing tumor volume. The somatostatin analogs do shrink it to a very small degree, but it's really not effective. The way we, the tools that we have to decrease the tumor size are initial debulking surgery. Um, some people use radiotherapy. Our unit are, are not big proponents of radiotherapy, but there are definitely indications for it. And then we really aim to have the smallest volume of tumor, which we then um, treat with medical therapies, mainly to control hormone levels rather than um, shrink the tumor because we know that these drugs are not really designed to shrink the tumor. They're really designed to manipulate the hormonal control and suppress the secretion of the hormones. Good question. Hi. Um, I'm new to understanding the different types of medications. And from what I've learned so far that you start with SL, uh, somatostatin ligands, receptor mm -hmm. ligands. And if it doesn't work, then you take a combination therapy. Mm -hmm. So it starts maybe at a lower percentage as far as getting the, the uh, biochemical control. Mm -hmm. Then if it's not helping, you do a combination. From the three drugs that you discussed, is there a medication that will just give one drug to, to do both of the SLR and the, let's say, pegmuzumab that so, attacks the IGF-1 as well as the GH. So probably the drug that has, in the current FDA-approved medications, the drug that has the major efficacy is pegvisamont. So pegvisamont is a drug that, is, it's a growth hormone receptor antagonist. I just mentioned it. It binds to growth hormone receptors on the liver. And in the early registration studies, they showed that if you could, where obviously patients had as much drug as they needed, 90% of patients were able to attain normalization of the IGF-1. So that is definitely the most efficacious drug. Uh, the, the, it's extremely expensive. Um, and it's, it's and it was late. It was approved later than somatostatin analogs. So somatostatin analogs got into the picture far earlier than pegvisamont. But since its approval, um, it was initially approved as a second line drug, which also put it sort of backward in terms of being the initial therapy. It was only approved as a second line drug. But recently, in the last five years, they've changed the. It's, there's been a change in the label, and it is being used as a first line drug. And in the last guideline recommendations, there was actually one pathway which suggested that you could begin with just pegvisamont. So the reason why somatostatin analogs probably are the are the first choice even though they um, aren't as efficacious in terms of normalizing the IGF-1 is because they have been proven and there is documented shown data that there's no tumor enlargement on them and that they do contain tumor volume. So subsequent studies have come out which have hinted at that factor 
with pegvisimod, but it hasn't really been studied with the attention and focus that it was with the somatostatin analogs. So people like the idea that they're started on a drug which has demonstrated tumor suppressive effects as well as an efficacy in terms of lowering the IGF-1. And I think that's how it got into that position way early in the game. Subsequently, all these new agents are emerging and I'm thinking that the guidelines are going to be revised as we get the data that we need to really put these newly, more newly developed drugs into that position. But I think pegvisamont is, is probably ahead of, the, well, these agents are still in clinical trial, many of the things we discussed today, but pegvisamont um, is already in the latest guideline um, as a first line drug. But it, it did take a while to get there. It required a label change because it was initially marketed as a second line drug. And that was done in order to get it um, FDA approved in a pathway as a second line drug. They wanted to get it approved quickly and they sacrificed it being a first line drug to really get it um, into the market as a second line drug. And then subsequently, that label has been modified. So now it is a first line drug and it's, it's extremely effective. In fact, I can tell you honestly, I don't have one single patient that, is, that has been on Pegvisamont that's had the ability to escalate the dose to as high as patients need. And some of the patients, I have two people that are on 60 milligrams a day, which is an absolutely enormous dose, but they're totally controlled. And, um, you know, the, the recommended starting dose is 10 milligrams and the average dose is 30 or 40 milligrams a day. And now we're even giving pegvisamont alternate days or once a week. Um, it's been found that daily is overkill. So, you know, as we work with these drugs, we really are realizing that there are different ways that they can be administered and given both individually in combination. And I think that the guidelines are going to change as the cost, um, you know, comes down of drugs and that we learn to, to work with, you know, pick for someone who's $20 a milligram. So you do the math at 60 milligrams a day. It's absolutely exorbitant. But as we learn to work with these drugs and try different ways of administering them, we, we, and in combination, we're going to be able to get down combinations that work, um, achieve all the different goals we're looking for, and we don't break the bank, and that, and then the insurance will will pay. So it's a process, and um, you know we just got to go step by step, and you know be gutsy about how we try to manipulate these drugs. And uh, I certainly have done that in my career, and I've been really surprised at how much less one can use of the recommended doses of these drugs and still get absolute efficacy. And then if one can just add little bits of amounts of the more efficacious drugs that could be way more expensive in combination, maybe not as frequently as daily, then you really have the best of all worlds. You have you know, a more affordable combination with many of the benefits of some of the things that are unattainable at the cost that now touted to be given at. So I think we have really a lot of good tools in our armamentarium and we're learning how to use them better as we go. And then we have very exciting tools on the horizon, which I've just shared a little bit with you today. And we're all anxiously awaiting the FDA approval um, to be able to use them and, you know, spread the benefit of the advantages of the administration and the efficacy. So just hold tight. I know it's not easy, but I think there's a lot of good stuff in the pipeline. <laughs> yeah.